Moore. Here. O'Kane. Here. Shaner. Here. Scott. Here. Waters. Here. Can we stand for a moment in silent prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, we got to do some interviews today. Anthony Fravel, Gillian Kosovo Sister City Committee, come on up and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve. I think we know why you want to serve, but... Fantastic. Uh, my name is Tony Fravel. Uh, I was recently deployed to Kosovo for the last six months or so. Um, in that time, I was in charge of three munis municipalities uh, as the deputy commander, and every day I would drive through the city of Jalan. Um, so I've made quite a few uh, contacts and relationships with the people of Jelani. I also am quite aware or well aware of the, uh, the town itself. Um, so in that time when I was through in Jelan, uh, myself along with a small delegation of people from Sioux City, we had the chance to meet with the mayor, uh, kind of meet with that group that was um, in Jelan, just kind of reaching, reaching across that island, just introducing ourselves to them. Um, I also was given some things by the mayor to pass along back here and uh, and after I came back from Kosovo, I met with uh, the mayor and then the committee, and I shared those, those accolades and those things with, with the committee. Great. Appreciate yeah. your service. Absolutely. Especially your willingness <coughs> to serve in this capacity. I think, I think there are others on this committee that feel the same way or have that service and that connection, and so I think it's really cool to be able to continue to forge that. So, <coughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. We'll let you know. Curious. Um, can I ask one question? Yeah. Are you, is your mother Joe? She is. So my mom worked with her at Smith School, and she unfortunately had my brother. So please send my apologies. I shall. Um, but I can think of nobody better served than somebody who served in <laughs> Afghanistan, um, has military service, and a teacher. You've signed up for a lot, and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dave Sopsky, Museum Board of Trustees seen him here okay well if he comes in let me know okay yeah. we'll go to the regular consent agenda today which is item 3 through 15 F consider him to pass unanimously if you want to speak on an item please come up as I read that item state your name and address for record if you want to speak on an item not under the agenda please come up under citizen citizen concerns I'll move the consent agenda second three is a reading of the City Council minutes of January 7th through the 10th Four is a motion acknowledging the January 11th Board of Adjustment action. Alex? Mayor, it's been requested to remand this back to the Board of Adjustment. The Board of Adjustment, I would make that motion to do so. For agenda item, the number 2021-0089. Second that. Go ahead. Uh, Jordan Roseboom, 391 Partridge Circle. Uh, I sent you guys the yep. remand request. Um, if anyone didn't get a copy, I've got a printed copy here uh, if you'd like it. Um, but that's it. I don't think I got that. Uh, it just, so Jessica just forwarded it. You do have an extra copy? Oh, Jessica, copy? I got it then. I'm good. Okay. If Jessica forwarded it, I just haven't opened it. Thank you. It's in our email too, but yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Call oh. the roll on. Alex's motion, please. O'Kane. Aye. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Moore. Aye. Uh, five is resolution, resolution designating Julie Shaner and Matthew O'Kane as the city council members of the Woodbury Community Information and Communication Commission. Six are resolutions approving the selection of Dean Stevens as a citizen representative on the Woodbury County Information and Communi Communication Commission. Seven, a resolution approving an IEDA targeted jobs withholding tax credit program application for coal link log logistics. Eight are actions relating to grants and gifts. A is a resolution approving a grant agreement from the FAA to provide economic relief to concessions at the airport. B is a resolution accepting the donation of the United States Army helicopter at the Mid America Transportation and Aviation Museum and authorizing a conditional deed of gift combat material for static display. 
C is a resolution accepting of the donation from the Siouxland Trails Foundation for the Big Sioux River Pedestrian Crossing. Nine are civil penalties and suspensions. Items 9A to C are resolutions assessing $500 civil penalties from against Walmart, Lawrence Foods, and Red Robin for violation of the beer, wine, and liquor laws. D is a resolution that needs to be amended. The motion is to amend the, the item as following. Resolution withdrawing the civil penalty of $1,500 and the 30-day suspension against Leeds Mart, DBA Select Mart, 4103 Floyd Boulevard, Sioux City, for violation of the Iowa beer, wine, and liquor laws pursuant to Iowa Code Section 123.5. So we have to make a motion to that? Both Correct. Separately. The license, license holder has provided a certificate that the employee that sold did attend the requisite class, <coughs> and they would like to assert it against this penalty. So I'll move that amendment to the regular motion then. Second. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Moore. Aye. O'Kane. Aye. E is a resolution scheduling a hearing on a $300 civil penalty against Charlie's Wine and Spirits for violation of the cigarette laws. F is a resolution hearing, scheduling a hearing on a $1,500 civil penalty and a 30-day suspension of the cigarette permis permit issued to VIE Stig and Vape Lounge for violation of the cigarette laws. 10 are actions relating to agreements and contracts. A is a resolution approving a one-year service provider agreement extension with first class security for security, Skywalk Security. B is a resolution authorizing execution of a pre-construction agreement with IDOT for the hot mix asphalt overlay on South Lewis Boulevard. C is a resolution approving a second amendment to the downtown agreement with Kinseth Hospitality Company, Kinseth Downtown Sioux City Hotel Development Inc. and the Downtown Sioux City Hotel Associates LLC 904th Street. Mayor? Yes. This is just another example of how the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted our businesses in Sioux City. And it's, it's extremely unfortunate. I, I, I hate to see this ongoing in the report, COVID-19, but it is ongoing and it's had a direct impact. I do want to point out to council and the mayor in the staff write-up, the financial impact says this action does not change the previous financial commitments for the project, including the payment of property taxes and hotel motel taxes. Note also revenue from the Iowa Reinvestment District began in October 2019 and will not be impacted by this amendment. That's still all correct, isn't it, Marty? Okay. But it's just, you know, it's just another negative impact that we have to deal with and um, we'll deal with it. Thanks, Mayor. 11 are actions relating to personnel. A is a resolution amending the airport's authorized payroll complement by reclassifying two part-time positions as one full-time airport worker position. B is a resolution amending the position classification manual by approving updated job descriptions for airport pool manager, cashier, concession worker, lifeguard, instructor, and pool manager. Please note that the correction of the lifeguard, instructor, guard class code, it should have been 4-2305, an amendment is not needed per legal. 12 are actions <clears throat> relating authorizing payments. A is a resolution authorizing payment to Continental Fire Sprinkler for installation of sprinklers at station 1, 6, 7, and 8. B is a resolution authorizing payment to Jazz Jazz a better restoration for cleanup of the wastewater treatment plant. Mayor, I would like to hear from uh, Director Pingle if possible. Yep. I know that there was some questions about the work that was done out there and some cracks in the wall, and I was wondering if they ever came back to fix those up. Tom Pingle, Utilities Director. Um, uh, yes, it's it's being restored right now. Okay. Engineer. Uh, has not um, admitted that it was a flaw in their design yet. Okay. Um, but they have supplied uh, um, a piece of equipment that <clears throat> stops the H2S from going into the building. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would just say, I, while you're up here, and I mean, while we're paused on the item, I would just say I appreciate your information, the memo, but also hopefully we can uh, continue those discussions. I know our legal team is looking into it because I think it's pretty frustrating when we had to operate the way that we were due to what was happening. So I'm glad that we're taking those measures. So 
So thanks. Thank you. She has a resolution authorizing payment to Sioux City Engineering for the South Lake Port Street and Singing Hills Boulevard Sanitary Sewer Manhole Replacement Project. D is a resolution authorizing payment to Mark Albanicious for the West 17th Street Water Main Replacement Project. E is a resolution approving a settlement of a claim and authorizing payment. F is a resolution approving settlement of a claim and authorizing payment. G is a resolution approving fund transfers for December. H is a motion approving payments for December. 13 are actions relating to property. Resolution A is a resolution proposing to sell property at 304 Kings Highway, petitioner Don and Carrie Kling Klingberg. B is a resolution proposing to sell property at 310 Kings Highway, petitioners Joe and Catherine Barnes. C is a resolution proposing to sell real property at 3010 Panama Street, petitioners John and Pat Patricia Gunya. 14 are applications for beer and liquor license. See the list and come forth if you have questions. 15 are receipt of minutes. See the list, come forth if you have questions. Anyone to be heard on any of those? Passes 5 0. 16 are recommendations of planning and zoning. Resolution approving the replat of lot 789 of Eagle Ridge, petitioner black and blue development. PNZ recommends approval of the item. I'll move that. Second. Jason Gary for planning and zoning. This is a simple moving of the line, so to speak, for, the, for an existing housing development. So they come forward and they're readjusting the plat lines uh, for the development. It was a fairly simple matter. There was no opposition heard and it was unanimous vote. Jason, could I ask you this? Yeah. Um, I just, just a clarification. There, sure. there was some, in the report written up, there were some easement concerns, but those were, have been resolved. But then under the findings of fact, it still states that the final plat does not resolve the easement encroachment. I don't know, that's one. Seven. I'm gonna have, have to look at staff a little bit on that one. I can't remember the Man. easements being an issue for us when we went to plat. For replant. It's just a clarification. I, it looks like they've been resolved. But yeah, that's the way it appeared to us too. I don't know that it has. I'm just, yeah, I'm just reading it under. Because otherwise it would have been a subject to an easement, right. um, but I didn't get that sense in the meeting. Jeff Hansen, Community Development Operations Manager. The easement in question that's also referenced in the staff report is on lot six, which immediately to the east of this plat. Uh, there was some thought that the encroachment of that structure and the easement may result in some reduction on lot seven. We've been able to resolve that by preparing a legal document. Uh, so the encroachment's actually on lot six in the easement, and so it's no longer uh, a condition of approval on this plat. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you. Yeah. Passes 5 0. 17 is a hearing and ordinance rezoning 1600 and 1620 Pacific Street. The petitioners Paul Koskovich, PNZ recommends, re recommends rezoning to BP Business Park. I'll move that. Second. Hearings now open. Anyone to be heard? Uh, so this uh, rezoning actually came forward as a request to go to the general industrial zone. Uh, staff made a recommendation and, and the, and the uh, uh, Board of uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred in the judgment that it should be a business park. It's it, 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 it's adjacent to neighborhood housing. We want uh, so we want some transition element there as well as uh, uh, as well as to have design standards on that property. I think it's good development, but we uh, just didn't want it to go to general industrial. And so the recommendation before you is BP. Anyone to be heard? Jason, on this, it's the design standards and the setbacks that are the key differences. I think the I think for my sense of it was it especially for the especially for the petitioner, the concern was use within sight of the structure. Uh, that, they, that would there be any restrictions uh, that might 
uh, hold back tenants that it would be relieved in the GI and also they did want relief from design standards was my sense of it. Uh, but the board of, uh, but the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, we want design standards on this. This is on, on Highway 75. Also, it doesn't make sense as <coughs> how close it is residential. It does not appear that it's going to stand in the way of the tenant that he proposed to have in that site do work. But does it limit like small contractors in the future? They can be in that zone. I think they were looking automotive too. Yeah, and this is this matches the same development they did over by Home Depot. No, I know. Yeah. I just want to make sure that they're not limited to <coughs> who can go in there because First they build planning. these normally for small contractors. Yeah. Yeah, BP would allow the small contractor use. The one on Cunningham is also in the BP zoning district. <laughs> the main difference is outdoor storage would not be allowed in BP. Or the what wouldn't? Outdoor storage of material or equipment. Paul Koskovich, only thing for Ben and I is our property that came when we bought the bakery is GI. And so with the, they're not accepting GI, we have to follow design standards. However, we also, in the sale, got other lots going to the south that are already zoned GI. So now next year, when we take one of those lots and build the same building here, we don't have to follow design standards because it's already GI. Our property's GI. Everything around us is GI. I mean, this really needs to be GI. But what is it now? NC4, neighborhood conservation. No, oh, so at least, Residential at least this is a more dense zone than what they've got right now. But the other property, you're right. If it's GI, you would not have to do that. That'd be correct. Our entire property right now is GI. So now we're going to have GI property, BP property and more GI property. It just doesn't make any sense. And is the reason, Jason, the thought, I mean, you talked of it being a buffer due yep. to it right there. Is it any closer than some of the other projects he's talking about? Okay, so I'm not going to speak necessarily anything he owns the south. I know the immediate building he's talking about directly to his south, which is a large, yeah. I mean, that takes up the, I mean, it takes up a lot of that lot. So I don't think we're overly worried about there being a substantial outdoor storage on that site. But Correct. immediately around the area in which we dealt with, you've got residential homes that are right on the other side of it. Um, it is, I understand that it, it's zone GI now, and that's the way that, that, that it flows. Would it be BP if it was a different scenario and we had to rezone? I don't know. It depends on how close it is to residential, how much business is around it and stuff like that. But in this case, we just looked at this specific case, BP is a, is a far better fit in our judgment than a GI is. You get across the street and you get into straight GI and that's all makes sense. But right here, you've got residential right on the backside of it. This is the old parking lot. That's correct. And how could, how could it have been zoned residential? That's what it was zoned under the old code as well. That just pulled through. They what? It was zoned, I believe it was RG50P, which is a residential zoning district with a parking overlay. Is that with the new zoning that you guys did, or was that the old? That was the old. So what is it with your new handy dandy $300,000 study? What is it? NC4, which would be the equivalent. Neighborhood conservation. Correct. Can you pull up the site map from Beacon to give everybody a better idea of what we're talking about here? No, I know where you're talking. There was an old garage out there too. You were just by that car, that car That's lot. That's correct. So that car lot, you know, backs up to a neighborhood, uh, road, right to the south of us, road machinery, backs up to a neighborhood. They're all GI. Yeah, the, the issue in question though, is that those are pre-existing businesses. And whenever you're gonna go into the place where you're gonna have a new business in, in this existing location, we're, we're, you know, the rezoning request is because we have to take a fresh look. And one of the common challenges that we faced with the new zoning code, and especially on design standard enforcement, this becomes an issue is like everything around me doesn't have to abide by those. Those are pre-existing, they're existing businesses, we can't enforce it against them, but if they come back and make substantial changes, there's a possibility we could. And so design standards are a flowing process. We're adding them as development takes place. And, and so I- We yeah. used to be able to do site plans, but this new zoning was gonna take care of all that, and it didn't, so you, now you've got to, anyway. 
You could still require that as a condition of approval. Yeah, you could do that as a whatever he wants and do, and require a site plan. Correct. But to Jason's point, he's just saying, you know, the other properties are grandfathered in. When yeah. we have a fresh look at something like this, we should uphold it to a standard that I we want. I get that, but you could, you could make it be GI with a site plan. Right. You could still do and get what they want and get what they want and not limit the use. The, the, challenge, the challenge with that approach is that this is not going to be the last time we have the GI business park fight. This won't end design standard say, being the key issue. Precedent. So why don't we just do it every time that way? GI with a site plan that enforces the design standards, then it turns into GI with no design standards. So this, you it know. It worked that, before, but you guys thought this would be so much easier, but it's not, it's not proven to be any easier because you still want to have some control over the design, which I understand, I get that. But it hasn't made it any easier, that's for sure. There was concern from staff as well as some of the uses that would be allowed between BP and GI. The use that's recommended or that the petitioner is um, asking for is allowed in both. Um, however, GI would allow a lot of the heavier zoning, like your salvage yard, adult entertainment type uses. We didn't feel that those would be the Salvage yard takes a special, it used to, I think it still does. You can't just go put a salvage yard on a GI. You've got to get a board of adjustment approval for a salvage cool. yard. So don't use those extremes because that's not the case, right? You got to have a you got to have a board of adjustment to put a salvage yard anywhere in this community. Conditional use permit would be required. Yes. Yeah. So that's entirely different than a contractor was storing his his skid loader outside with a fence around. Entirely different. Ben Murphy, thirty four fifty one Wanamaker. I just want to comment quick. Is we're fortunate to own the old bakery. And that, if we did not, and that was spec space as well, we would be in direct competition with them at a different design standard. You go across the highway, straight across the street, Casey Fenton spec building, GI. They're direct competition to us. So we've made a significant investment into bringing businesses and, and, and housing them in affordable spaces. The design standards were not competitive with directly what's next door to us. Granted, we're lucky to own that building. However, if we didn't, we'd be competing against that building and right across the street that are both GI. And, and with the design standards that we're set to, our prices have to go up. Thank you. Mr. Murphy? Yes, sir. Right. So the design standards, you have particular you have particular ones that are causing the... Correct. I mean, the design standards for, for the BP on the outside are stone, lap siding, different metal materials, stucco, the cost of the exterior facade goes up and it's not only the front but it's the two sides on this property so instead of normal corrugated or whatever uh it's it's not issued here so on all three sides of the building we've got to do a, a higher decorative material and at, at the end of the day it, it results in considerably more money <coughs> but the but the residential area is you're on, that would be on the back side of your building yeah and i think we actually jeff do we have to get a variance for the back as well I was going to say, still the back would be exposed to the residential that doesn't have to have those. So as part of the rezoning request to BP, or at least the recommendation to go to BP, um, there is an option, and we completed that on the Cunningham property as well. You can go to the Planning and Zoning Commission and request waiver or some reduction of the design standards. In those cases, the back of those buildings, we allowed through commission approval of corrugated metal. So that would still have to go to P&Z. Staff could not approve the use of corrugated metal on this building if it was rezoned to BP. But what we could do is rezone a BP and send it back, or then they could make they that would, request? They would make that request through P&Z, and based on their decision, then the decision would stop at P&Z, or it could be appealed to the city council. Which deflates your whole argument, because you're standing there saying you want to protect the residences, and you want to make sure they have a nice neighbor but go to P&Z and we'll probably waive it for there, but we'll insist that you have it when across the street is a... Well, I don't know what the outcome of that be, and I'm not saying... I'm just saying, though, it. you can tell me that, but it's not going to happen because the P&Z, in their defense, was worried about this mm -hmm. and protecting the neighborhood. So why in the world would they not worry about the houses behind and, and not worry about the sides that are facing other warehouses? It doesn't... It's not logical what you're standing there saying right now. Every time we've gone through this this discussion about BP and design standards, 
this is the same, we, we, we repeat this challenge over again, but every time we've, we've come forward with, somebody's come forward requesting a variance, oftentimes we're pretty reasonable people, we find ways to make it work. For instance, the back part facing residential may not be as key of an issue as the frontage facing the road um, on, se on 75. And so that is usually where we kind of say, okay, these parts of the design standards, maybe we can make a compromise on this side, we can compromise here and so on, but we get the bulk of what we want um, and they get a deflation in costs, but we still get a nice building with good aesthetics. Zone BP. Zone apes, BP. And, case whatever yeah, style or it's kind of got a fence around its uses so it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't get uh, transferred into something different in the future. But, but we can't answer the question because it's not Zone not BP before. yet and we haven't gone yeah. through that process, so. Yeah. What's gonna stink though is, is again, in a year, when one block to the south, we build another one, it's gonna look completely different. We could have two buildings that look identical and nice, zone GI, but now we're gonna to have to have one building that meets the design standards possibly and one that doesn't. I mean, we're trying to, I mean, that bakery looks like a million times better. I mean, I don't, think, does, we're getting, I don't yeah. think we're getting enough credit here and, and, and we're, our, our property is GI, it just doesn't make sense to not have all of our property GI. Which, before you, what? Property to the south? The so one right where it there. says subject property. So continuing south there, Dan. We they own, own those, all that parking back We own there. all those lots back there too. It came with the property. And we're just gonna keep rolling down there because there's a strong demand. And you know, so again, it's GI right now. But that, what's the NC4 on that piece? It's to the south. That's that another parking lot. It's not the subject property. Okay. This is the subject oh. property in green. They had two parking lots. And some of them they parked their truck. Okay. Came in from the routes and that back in the day. So help me out. I, I was thinking maybe we we're getting tripped up on outdoor storage, but that's not oh, the. Heavens no. On that's our site, not, on that's our site not plan, the we issue. submitted a 6,000 square foot building. It's going to have four bays in it, and we'll just lease them out to uh, most common uh, small business owners. It's just like our project down by Home Depot. So will it mess up your time frame or your time schedule if, if we went back to plan and zoning for this? these adjustments that we're talking about? Our materials are ordered uh, for, the, for, the, for the shell of the building, but no, it will not. If we go back another month, that'd be fine. We'd be accepted to it. I mean, wouldn't that be a little bit more efficient than to have them, you'd have to file another application, wouldn't they, or a petition? Are you referring to the design standards? The design standards, yes, sir. Correct. Could we, could we do that? Because we, we don't have a meeting next Monday, and we have one in two weeks from today, could we get something done by? Our next meeting is February 8th. Oh. But they have to provide, if I, if I see where you're going, they still have to provide us with the design for it and then staff reviews it and staff e either can approve it because it meets all the standards or they can't because it doesn't and then the petitioner appeals to the P&Z for relief. And so I, I'm assuming You've got the shell, but I don't know if you've got a design for it right now that you would present to staff that would, would then would be appealed and go to P and Z. But I, I don't I don't think what we're talking about here is not the design standard, right? The whole point is we'll be talking about zoning this correctly at GI and then we won't even have the conversation about design standards. Well no what I was thinking Well if that we could yeah. you could do it that way, but yeah. you'd have to put it with a site plan, right? You could, just, you could make a GI subject to a site plan. Council can make that. Work. Yeah, we can do that. And Jason's point is you're going to run into that more. Then you're going to have the standard of where everyone's. But you run into up. it now when you do this because everybody can go to the BP that whatever we're doing and ask for, well, don't make me put good metal on this where nobody will see it type of stuff. So it, it, you're either going to have a site plan or you're going to have people running back to, P and Z. The P and Z. Yeah. I don't know what's what's better, but you have you're gonna you have that op you'll always have that opportunity. And I thought that Jason, and maybe I'm wrong, was just making the argument that doing that way at least you uphold the integrity of having it be BP. The the key question, yeah, for me, the for I guess I'd say for the Planning Zoning Commission, I think their their basic idea was the BP uses match what we want on the site, mm -hmm. given residential. And um, as far as design standards, yes, it enforces design standards, but we've been willing to compromise those before. And rather than site plans, which have to go 
all the way to council to, for final approval, we can modify those, um, we can make modifications to uh, the site, uh, to the design standards at the P and Z level, and then the petitioner's done and it. And it so I would say it actually shortens up part of the cycle. Except for it doesn't give them a right to appeal. Yes, it no, does. No, it does. They because can appeal they can to you. If they, if they don't like our decision, they can always come to you. Appeal always. to council. Yeah, they've and, done it before. Yeah, and so then it also limits the use. Yeah, of this that. isn't the first time we've been here for something like this. Is this BP going to require that they also change material on the backside that actually faces the neighborhood? Or is it going to be a three-sided? They'd have to use the decorative material facing the street and the parking lot. And then the back of the building and the other sides could use standard material, but corrugated would still require P&Z approval as we did on Cunningham. But with it being NC4, I thought we we're trying to preserve the integrity of the neighborhood, not Highway 75. The integrity of the residential neighborhood for the use that could be here. So I guess we're more worried about what could be located in GI than we are as far as what the what back of the building, like. as far as at least that was a discussion on the commission level, is that as Jason mentioned, it wasn't so much the material on the back of the building, it was the use, the heavy use that could be there. That makes sense. Under GI. So we were thinking much more along the design standard because that's increasing your cost. What staff is worried about and what the P&Z was saying is they wanted to make sure we were cognizant of the use and then they would work with you on the design standard. All right, but Jason did say. Yeah, I would say, I would say it, it's not an either or, it's an and. Yeah. It's, we, we're concerned sure. about both. All right, but Jason, you did say you were more or the committee is more concerned about what's facing outward. Yeah, the yeah. Element. I would say if you were to go back and look at the record of the of P and Z in the past on these type of issues when it comes to design standards, I would say the record continually shows me and I think probably staff also that we're more concerned about what's facing the road than we are <coughs> about what it may be facing the rear. And so that is where I think compromises have been made, where we've been less less willing to make compromises on the front end where it's where it's vis highly visible to the public versus on the back end where it's there's not much visibility from a traffic perspective. I think Jeff can comment to this. Isn't it correct residential homes in Sioux City can have corrugated metal? The way they code, there are no design standards per se for residential. There's requirements that they have to appear uh, similar architect and design is within 300 feet of the neighborhood so we've had two requests just in the last six months <coughs> for individuals that have requested corrugated metal but they have to go through pnz to get that did they get approved yes they yeah. both did so we have residential homes that are getting approved for this material that we're trying to use on our building that's going to go next to these residential homes does this make sense and okay. they're saying they're willing to work with you on what the material would be they just it's not only that material but it's also the use of the property the, the use of the property is not a question. There's no issue between us and them. That's not the problem. The, but, but that's what I'm you saying. But if would sell it, the, the material we want to the material use. we want to use, Alex, they don't want to allow us to use. But also, they want to zone it BP to limit the uses that we can can be used for. That because if you sell it and we made it GI, we don't know what the next person's going to do. <coughs> we know that you would want to. What you want to do is okay in GI and BP, which is why they're making that recommendation. It's, to Jason's point, it's both. I think it's a little bit of overreach uh, telling someone to use their property. Can legal write something up, though, then on that? Well, you have zones well, for what they can use property for. But, and, if you can do over, all that with a site plan. Not overreach. I think, I think we're saying the same thing, I, I believe, if, if we could send it back to plan and zoning on February 8th. Is that the next meeting, February 8th? What are you going to send it back on, though? To, to the zoning or develop the, the, no, the, to develop the design plan. standards design. under the BP. Correct. And then they could come back to city council when? Is that two weeks later? Be the 22nd? Just pushing question. your 30-day time frame. I, I'm, I'm just confused what that's going to accomplish, because I, I firmly believe they're going to vote us no. On design standards or on or on zoning? Can design standards. Can't do that? I, I, you approve? I, yeah, I, you approve? I know everybody, I every time we come to this table, everybody thinks we're never going to compromise on design standards, and, and every, every time oh. we do. Wait a minute, I might stand corrected on this. I, if I, you disagree, approve, I disagree because we wanted to use corrugated metal at Cunningham, you guys voted no. 
I know, but you guys came back twice, and we modified even a second time after you came back and asked for more leniency on the design standards. We gave you even more leniency the second time you came back. I, I mean, I understand that we, you didn't get 100% of what you wanted for the entire site, but to say that we didn't compromise with you at all, the PNZ didn't compromise with you at all, is, is incorrect. I don't remember, and I'm not, trying to make, I'm not trying to make a fight with you, I'm just saying, you, I can't remember anybody coming back twice and getting a second compromise on design standards. So unless I've got the record wrong, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys came back twice for changes and we, we gave you two changes and you didn't appeal it to council if, because you, you felt it let's, was reasonable. <coughs> let's, let's try to get this resolved though. I might st do I stand corrected in what I was asking for? If you were to approve the rezoning to business park, that would be the next step. The petitioner would then submit the elevations to staff, either meeting the design standards or requesting uh, the corrugated metal, in which case we would have to deny it and they could then take it to planning and zoning for that approval. You could make that a condition if you wanted that to come all the way to city council for review. Well, we are, yeah, we already know it'll be denied, just, just what they're going to be proposing. So we already know it'll be denied. I'm just trying to, maybe we can't skip that step because we already know that the design standards will not be met under BP. But I'm concerned, and I don't know what the vote's going to be today, but I'm concerned that BP might be approved without that. Then you're still bound by the design standards. BP meaning the uses that Alex was talking mm -hmm. about, that it's not what you two are doing. You, you two are doing great things in Sioux City. It's the future owners of the property. What will GI, what will they be able to do? So we're concerned with the use. So I'm just trying to deal with, let's get BP in with the kind of design standards that you can that you can accept and that you can accept. The action before the council is for the approval of GI. If you did not want to approve the GI, you would have to make a motion to modify that to a different zone. That's not the way this is reading. Because um, it's staff's recommendation. The staff's recommendation is different, but the hearing and ordinance is for well, rezoning to not GI. The way you guys typed it up. It says we're voting on BP. Business BP business park. The staff the, the staff recommendation and the and the planning and zoning recommendation are the same. BP. I'm not, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Hearing no. an ordinance rezoning sixteen hundred and sixteen twenty Pacific. Yeah. Petitioner Paul Koskovich, PNZ recommends rezoning to BP. Yeah. PNZ is your committee. Yeah. That's what you're recommending, and that's yeah. what I'm reading. Correct. But yeah, the the <laughs> agenda <laughs> item is as it was presented to planning and zoning, which they voted with modifications. So the item before the council is for approval of GI. As submitted. As yeah. submitted um, yeah. by the petitioner. So you would have to make a motion to modify that if you want to either vote well, up or down. We've been doing GI. these wrong because we've been doing whatever P and Z says to do, and that's BP. So you're saying in the future they should have to bring their recommendation. GI and then then we modify based upon their recommendations because that's not what I'm reading here I'm reading exactly and I made the motion exactly what's here I Can just tell you what's presented on the agenda. I know but it's not what I have here and I don't type that so I, I don't know. well <laughs> then these guys need to figure it out. I, well, I don't know I'm just telling you what I'm reading and then what I read yeah. is what the motion and the second is so we don't we can argue about we just have to clear up which what's there but that's not that's what yeah. I read and that's what you got to go by unless we modify that correct and the published agenda is for GI so if we need to withdraw it as previously moved I'll make, move my motion I'll withdraw it I'll withdraw the second okay because the the hearing and ordinance should be on approval yeah. of GI yeah. for clarification so the resolution approving replot of lot 789, no. 17. Yeah, the, the uh, hearing and ordinance rezoning 1600 and 1620 Pacific Street, petitioners Paul Koskovich being. Uh, Just right here, I'm sorry. Zone classification GI. Planning zone commission rectum, uh, okay. The zoning classification GI general industri industrial, the planning and zoning commission recommends rezoning to BP business park. I'll move that. I'll second. Scott. Well, no, well, you're voting. That's first. Well, you, you can't. You correct. The item on the floor of affirmative vote would be to approve GI. Now you can either vote on that as is, or there can be a motion of the council in a second to modify that to the recommendation of planning and zoning. 
Yeah, so it's GI the way it is. Correct. So if you don't want it to be GI, somebody has to make a motion to rezone it to B, BP or whatever. So I would move to rezone it as BP as directed by staff or recommended by staff. Is there a second? You're making a motion to amend then. Correct. Or amend to go to. Which will be what we originally read then. Correct. Are we going to amend with? They would be able to go back to PNZ and work with them on those modifications. But can we direct that back right. to plan and zoning, or does it have to go through staff first? With all due respect. Sorry, and to, and to back up, my understanding is that if it's GI, you could still require a site plan. Exactly. Um, which is a modification you could make, uh, GI approval with mo site plan modification, and you could request that that comes back to the council level. That's an additional option that you would have in addition to just modifying to BP. But with the site plan, you still get all the GI uses, mm -hmm. which is their point of why oh. we want BP is for the- You can put no. the site plan restrictions. Oh, okay. Absolutely, you can, absolutely you can. I think we should do that. Yeah. Is there a second to Alex's motion? And for clarification, the motion was to amend to BP. Correct. Ice for lack of a second, I'll move an amendment to the recommendation of the GI to require it on this particular piece because of where it's at. I don't want to go to jump into a bunch of site plans. I don't. I know you feel that's going to happen. I don't. But there are certain circumstances where I believe that it still has merit and with a with a site plan uh, requiring a site plan. Is there a second to that? Second. Scott? Aye. Waters? No. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Shaner? And to be clear, I just worried about it setting precedent. It seemed like it was six of one, half a dozen of another. It would have been the exact same scenario. You just set it precedent that now we're going to be able to come back. Everyone can say, well, I want a site plan the way that you did it with them. That's the only reason I'm voting against it, because I think you're going to get the exact same outcome. They get the exact same outcome, and I, I don't. I don't see people stampeding in here to do site plans because they've got to still get this stuff approved by staff oh, yeah, no. in, and a commission. Right. Yep. So Jeff, the, so the site plan then would sh would address all the design standards and the variations of those and the uses. You can require that in the site and plan. The uses, correct. Now on the regular motion. And as a requirement from this rezoning, typically site plans would stop at P and Z. With this requirement, condition on the rezoning, it would come through P and Z and council would make final decision. Regardless of any appeals, it comes to council. What, what's our time frame on that? 30 days. Come back to the council? Because it won't go to P and Z for two weeks on the 9th plan and zoning's on the 9th I believe it's the 8th 8th and additionally that's dependent because this is a hearing and ordinance that's also dependent on the timing to waive three readings and approve everything tonight mm -hmm. as well all right thank you you're going to vote you want to read it okay yeah waters so what is this one on this would First be reading now. First reading as on amended. Main, as amended to include the site plan on GI. Okay. Gotcha. No. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Janer? Aye. Scott? Aye. I should have said the hearing is closed. I'm sorry. Uh, is there a, uh, I know there will be opposition, but is there at least a majority that would move to waive the statutory rule? Anybody opposed? Other than Alex? No. I move to waive the the statutory rule. Second. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? And I can still vote aye to mm -hmm. yep. do Wait. that because it's like I understand. I was just saying right. a lot of principle. Yep, you can. So aye. I'll move second and third. Second. Okay, this one you can vote electronically.
passes uh, four to one waters votes no 18 and hearing an ordinance vacating the east west alley at 311 prescott street petitioners dario garcia pnz recommends approval i'll move it second hearings now open go ahead jason for both of these uh both uh, item 18 and 19 it's fairly simple we're doing a simple alley vacation uh, both of these were unanimously voted on with no opposition. It, it didn't make sense for us to really keep any of these inside of the inside of the city ownership. Anyone to be heard? Hearing is now closed. Passes 5-0. Anybody opposed waiving statutory rule? No. I'll move it. Second. O'Kane? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. I'll move second and third. Second. SS 5019 is a hearing and ordinance vacating the north south alley in the block bounded by West 22nd, Kellogg, West 23rd, and Everett Street. The petitioners, Tom McKenzie, PNZ recommends approval. I'll move it. Second. Hearing's now open. I think. Yeah, yeah nothing more to add on this one other than just what I already talked Anyone about. Anyone to be heard? Hearing's closed. Passes 5-0. Anybody opposed waiving statutory rule? No. no. I'll move that. Second. Jayner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. I'll move second and third. Second. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Jason. Hearings 20 is a hearing resolution assessing... We're still waiting on Alex. Oh, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Sorry about that. There it is. Hi, bad. Hmm? <laughs> trying to figure out. This is my theory. a hearing and a resolution assessing a $300 civil penalty against Joe's Mini Mart for violation of cigarette laws. I'll move that. Second. Hearing is now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. This is 5021. It's a hearing resolution assessing a $300 civil penalty against the come and go number 251 for violation of the cigarette laws. I'll move it. Second. Hearing is now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5022 is a hearing resolution assessing a $300 civil penalty against Leeds Food and Fuel for violation of the cigarette laws. I'll move it. Second. Hearing's now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. I'll abstain on this one. Conflict of interest. Passes four to zero to one. Mr. Moore abstain. Twenty three is a hearing and resolution assessing a, assessing a fifteen hundred dollar civil penalty or thirty day suspension against High V Main Street for violation of the cigarette laws. I'll move that. Second. Public hearings now open. I got to tell you, I'm sure they'll pay the fifteen hundred dollar fine, which really bothers me that we don't have the option to have this to get to a point where you're up for a thirty day suspension. If we should have the option to decide what a business has because they just pay the fine and keep selling a lot of cigarettes. It's anyway, the hearings now uh, closed.
passes 5 0. 24 is a hearing resolution approving plans and specs for the annual manhole rehabilitation project. I'll move it. Second. Hearing's now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Before you leave, I meant to send you a text, Gordon. You drive Military Road from about Sun Valley Golf Course all the way to Riverside. Those hydrants are in the worst condition of any I've ever seen. Can we get them painted one of these days? It's, it really looks tacky. They're just rusted and not in very good shape. And I keep forgetting to send you a text I'm sorry, or an email. Sorry. Passes 5-0. 25 is an ordinance amending Chapter 2.46, Sioux City Environmental Advisory Board of the Municipal Code to expand membership eligibility to employee of a business within Sioux City who resides either inside or outside the city limits. Somebody else will have to move that. I'm not sure I'm in the board. I'll move that. I, I have a question. Oh, second. Now, does this include someone outside of the state of Iowa or just the city limits? Because it doesn't say the state. It just says either inside or outside of state. It could be inside or outside of the state, as long as they're employed or own a business within Sioux City. So it could be South Sioux or the Dunes or Moville. I think this is much better language. It was kind of weird to single out educators previously, so I appreciate the update. Julia, do you have a concern of outside the... I do have a concern with outside of the state. Um, just that my concern is you should at least be able to vote in our state, you know, to serve vote for city, you know, officials, state officials. So I guess I don't know if this, I know that we've made um, um, proposals before and let someone not inside city limits, someone outside of city limits, but I guess I didn't realize that it have in the past has it reached outside of state boundaries oh yeah you have people from the dunes serving on the art center don't we yes correct and a few years ago the employment for city employees also based on right that nation extends into different states as well which is a new change that i was aware of but I my, my fear is we have a board i'll let it remain nameless but we have more people on that board that are from outside the city than are on from the city. Mm -hmm. And it's a board that takes a lot of money. Mr. Collette will know what I'm talking about, but. Well, and I think it is one of those, I mean, it's our, it's our region, it's our demographic. We can't really change where we are and people tend to live in these different areas. Well, I understand, but I can tell you that if I want to get on the library board in North Sioux City, I guarantee you that will not be possible. But yet we allow that. I, I just question why we, yeah, no, it's it's a fair question. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't aware that outside of state boundaries that I was not aware of until now. Roger Benson, Environmental Services. Uh, within this ordinance, it does say that five of the the members do need to be residents of Sioux City, so you would have a majority that are local. And how many are on that? Uh, nine currently. Clarification. Who are we waiting for? Me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. Take your time. Passes three to two. I think we ought to not do second and third today on this one. 26 is an ordinance amending chapter 10.98 for schedules of the municipal code to adopt new traffic schedule. I'll move first reading. Second. Anyone to be heard?
which passes 5 0. Any, anybody opposed to reading the second and third on waiving the rules on this one? No. I'll move that. Second. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Chainer? Aye. I'll move second and third. Second. I missed it. Oh, five zero. Twenty sevens resolution scheduling a hearing on amendment number two to the amended and re restated combined central Sioux City CBD urban renewal plan property at seven fourteen Fourth Street. I'll move this. Second. Now, are we just we're putting this out, and so we're agreeing to the agreement, right? Okay. Well, I mean, I voice my concerns, and it's nothing against. The Carlsons, I'm glad they're Renee Billings, they're doing. development coordinator. Yeah. Um, the agreement will come back on February 28th for okay, approval. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I've, as I told you in different meetings, I have real problems with a, with a loan or a grant on <coughs> retail-type projects and office-type projects because you put somebody else at the... You know, I don't care about the property tax uh, rebate. I got no problem with that. The 100000 is a real problem for me, and I don't... I don't want you to walk away from here today thinking that it's not because it is and I made that clear to the staff in the past so yep and our plan is to use sales tax funds for the economic development yeah. grant that will be part of it um, they will have some sales tax producing entities within the building um, so when Bob and I met with them we thought that would be a good offer for them um, I don't know if Jeff you want to come and share any more about the project the mayor and council this step just sets the public hearing to amend no but I don't want to get up here in a month and, and mm -hmm. think that I'm trying to Blind side. I'm, I'm, I want to know. Want them to know that. No, absolutely, I understand, and uh, just I appreciate the opportunity to come up and, uh, and speak with everybody. Obviously, you can you can see we already have some progress going uh, going on the site. You know, ultimately, uh, I try to drop off some different uh, information for for the council to to review. Um, I think that this checks a, a ton of boxes in regards to this project. Not only from a you know obviously elevating property taxes and taking a unfortunately dilapidated building that sat there for a long time in our city's epicenter um, and turning it into something that's hopefully very special. But also with the commitments we have from our um, from our tenants, they're all you know they're all local entrepreneurs that have either locations in other parts of town or it'll be new locations. Um, there'll be significant sales tax that'll be generated. Um, Ichiban Japanese Steakhouse is going to have a, a sushi bar steakhouse uh, concept inside. Uh, Lindy Stouter is going to have the Warp Zone Arcade and Tap Room inside. She's a local entrepreneur, who actually won the Sioux City Go uh, Innovation Award. So obviously there'll be sales tax in both of those events. We are uh, I'm a staff for Sioux City history and nostalgia, so we will be keeping one bay. Uh, the Riviera Theater. We are going to name it the Riviera Theater. I think it's going to be a tremendous platform specifically for nonprofits uh, to host, uh, host a whole host of events. We've got a lot of ideas for. We're already partnering with Children's Miracle Network. We've had communication with Sioux City Community Schools and the Career Academy, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, the Hope Center, the Miracle League. There's a whole host of things that we can do there to kind of create a true city center uh, experience where we actually have uh, commerce happening along alongside of events and things like that. You know, I think that you know, Sioux City is at a, is at a, I think we've been at a tipping point. I think maybe COVID slowed that down a little bit, but I think we're at a tipping point in regards to the amazing job that, that we've done to add quality of life amenities to the community. I think we can all agree that um, attracting a, a stronger workforce is very, very important. I think that uh, one thing that, one way that you do that is you add um, quality of life facility, you know, facilities. And we've done, a t I mean, a ton of investment, specifically in downtown. Not only that, but we have added hundreds of units. I mean, we're going to be nearing, you know, 800 units downtown in regards to people living in these people to keep them downtown because those apartments are filling up. You guys are doing a good job. It's a good thing we have these hotels going down there. It's a good thing we have these, uh, these residents going in, but we need these quality of life amenities that are going to do so. Um, I do uh, respectfully, uh, Mayor Scott, I 100% understand that uh, and, and, and appreciate the opportunity for the, for the TIF, um, for those, for those tax rebates. And, and I know that we're going to take the, the property from you know, ten thousand dollars a year in taxes to forty. Um, so hopefully, it's a good investment for the for the um, city long term in that regard. Um, I would say that you know, there's also been, you know, in regards to the additional whether it's a sales tax grant, facade grant, or in different ways that that's that's occurred in the past. Um, I think it's a great way to ensure that the the project that we're that we're going to to do, which is with that with that those funds, we are actually adding square footage to the to the building itself. We're actually putting in 
second level mezzanines that will overlook all of 4th Street. Um, it'll add significant square footage, which obviously elevates the, 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 um, the property value, if you will, and also adds the experience, right? That is a, it adds a different experience um, for that building, which we should deserve, because it is an iconic Sioux City corner. And on top of that, you know, we're working with, uh, obviously we have a good relationship with downtown partners, with the CVB. I think that it's gonna be helpful even now with nothing in it, that when you take pictures of the convention center and things that are right, right, near, uh, right near our convention center that now as opposed to what the building used to look like, it looks like it does now. You know, when I was there doing roof inspections a while back, uh, we were there and, 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 and there's 3,000 people across the street at the, uh, at the convention center for a pool, pool tournament. And it, just, it was just shocking. It just was beyond my understanding that this building, the Riviera building, which is an, again, an iconic building, is nothing. And those people aren't coming over and enjoying all of those amenities. Um, uh, finally, I mean, I think that Sioux City's done a really good job of, of, of triangulating downtown. And obviously, we've done a great job of Historic 4th Street. We've done a great job of Pearl Street and the Hard Rock. You know, two years ago, if you'd have been standing in Bluebird Flats, you'd have been standing in a dilapidated building, looking at a dilapidated building in the Warrior. And the programs that have been available to, for, the, for funds for those projects have really helped those projects for long-term success. I think that these funds are going to help our project for long for long-term success. It's going to definitely help our tenants for long-term success. Um, and so I appreciate the, the reservations, but I do think that the willingness and what, what I think of precedence that it sets is we're all local local investors, right? We're all have Sioux City ties, you know, South Sioux City or Sioux City ties. You know, Jamie Stapleton, Josh Johnson are from South Sioux, Aaron Jones from Okoboji, and my wife Rachel and I uh, here from Sioux City. And also everyone within the building is a local entrepreneur that has, that will be, uh, have an opportunity for a platform uh, to show to, to cross market their brand and, and really market Sioux City. So um, definitely understand the reservations. Would love to answer any questions, um, but I ho I'm hopeful that we can uh, um, enjoy the the offer really that was we worked to work with the city that kind of had had been given to us, and I'd love to uh, move forward with it. So I appreciate all your comments. I, I really do. And by the way, did, did we get a name and address? We didn't. Thank you. you. Hi. Jeff Carlson, uh, 6701 Prairie View Court. Susan. I, I know who I'm talking with, but we do that for yeah. the record. No, but I appreciate your comments. The question I have on that, on the $100,000 uh, economic development grant, is that what we're calling that? Correct. When is that payable to? So the, as Jeff mentioned, they will be adding square footage for a second level mezzanine. So it will be on a reimbursement basis. So they have to complete the second level mezzanine right. in order to get those funds. So they have to increase the square footage of the building, which will increase the property value of the building. Okay. And there will be a minimum assessment agreement that correct. you, yep. you correct. spoke yeah, with, yes. Yep. Yeah, that will all be in the development agreement. No, you're doing great things in the city, and, and we appreciate that. We really do. Appreciate Keep up that. the good work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> just the paint made such a world of difference, and so it's just changing the entire environment down there, and I agree with you. Um, it's unfortunate when you have so many people across the street, maybe, you know, attending a conference or a tournament or anything, you know, to, to look across and see that. I mean, and especially to be connected to one of our best parking structures. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we've made investment and then you have the Badro next to that. I mean, it's, there's a lot of momentum and stuff. So I'm excited to see the work you're doing. Awesome. And to expand upon that too, the, you know, the mezzanines that are going to overlook that, that massive wall that oversees um, for sure. I mean, you can see all the way down. Those ceilings are 35 feet high. You can see all the way down over to the Scandinavian area. So to add that square footage is going to be uh, very cool. We also plan on adding uh, outdoor spaces. You know, we have there's existing square footage we're going to have that's going to overlook uh, the flex space, which is going to act as a landing spot to market Sioux City in general, kind of a Sioux City experience. It will also be a landing area for the theater. Um, so it'll be unique. Uh, we actually, just a couple things, but when we started swinging sledgehammers, that entire inside, by the way, is brick. Um, it was designed by a famous architect from New York. Uh, he did about 200 theaters in the United States in the 60s and 70s. So we're, we're going to restore the Riviera to that former glory inside with the, with the brick, 20-foot high ceilings as you come in. Um, it's going to be it's gonna look very urban. It's going to be hopefully something that, uh, again, we can be, so you can be proud of. As long as there's a, I was trying to look in the plans there, as long as there's a nice elevator to get up to that level, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm all for your project. It's just that one po sticking point for me. So I, I know you'll do a good job. Appreciate it, Mayor. Thank you.
passes 5028 is a resolution approving a transaction confirmation agreement with the Energy Authority to sell renewable natural gas from the wastewater renewable fuels plant. I'll move that. Second. Tom, I have a couple questions for you. Now we've done, the city has done business previously with the Energy Authority, correct? Correct, yep. How, how long? We've never uh, completed a contract to have an off-taker take the gas. So this is, <clears throat> this is the contract where we actually have a binding agreement with a, with a seller. So we're with the buyer, I should say. So we're the producer, TA is the broker, and now they found a, a buyer. So this contract is actually binding us with the buyer. <coughs> and what will we get a year? Um, <clears throat> so the buyer, I should say the broker gets 9%, the buyer is getting 16%, and we get 75%. So what's that? The taxpayers have spent a lot of money. I want them to hear what your projection for gas sales will be revenue wise or are after everything's paid we're looking at uh, about a million and a half a year right now with our current production a lot less than what we were told when we went into this it was more but we're not producing huh? at full capacity yet are we we were promised four or five million bucks right and that's If you were an attorney and said that, or if you were an accountant and you said that, guess what you'd have? You'd be calling your E&O insurer oh. and saying, uh, I got a problem here, but engineers can promise you the world and, and then they don't deliver and we get nothing. In well, the, is this I mean, because we're not at full the capital capacity. investment? You're not amortizing the capital investment at that number. I hate to tell you guys that. This is a three-year term? Yep. And yep, this expires in 2024. Then there's an About option for new. Gas prices are in an all-time high recent. Yep, so every, everything that is, we haven't sold has, or it's stored. Right. Kind of a, a, kind of a double-edged blade, blade there, so, because we've been storing the gas where when the price was low, now the price is high. We're gonna try to sell it all in a couple big bundles that we've been storing be able to capitalize on that investment i mean i think it is one of those things unfortunate that the price and different things have involved have evolved um i do think it's still a benefit i mean even if we're not going to capitalize on as much i know the uh, that i'm a glass half full type of person but i also think there are a lot of companies that look at investing in communities that are looking to offset their carbon footprint and rather than just burning off that gas into the atmosphere, pumping it into a pipeline and making any kind of revenue makes sense to me. But we never hold an engineer around here accountable for the, play, for the promises that they made. That bothers me. Well, well, my staff do them? is doing everything we can with our future projects to divert carbon into these digester reactors produce more biogas to your point yeah to your point we're I'll doing as much as we can right. to uh, kind of offset the issues that were in the past do we know what percent we're producing at right now Tom of the plant of the biogas plant capacity 25 percent 25 percent so yep. if we multiply what we're doing now that would we would live up to that four to five million dollar expectation we're just not at those production levels yet Process. I remember yep. Mr. Sims telling me that, you know, before, yep. because there'd been some problems with mechanical problems and things like that, that. I can't speak to that. No, I know, but uh, I know that had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Just saying there is that potential. Yep. So to, to be clear then, you're saying these revenues will fluctuate then for the next three years, the revenues that are coming in? It's, yep, it's more kind of like corn futures or soy, the, the right, it's price a is always changing. And the broker's job is to hold our biogas in storage and sell at good times. That's what we're getting 75%. That's our percent? We get 75% of the D3 RIN credit sell. Broker gets 9%. They only get 9, yeah. But that's yeah. pretty much industry standard. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Right. That, that's we're a really good contract. Being a broker. Well, but, where, but where's the other 16%? That goes to the person buying the gas. 
They're buying it and storing it. Oh, I see. They're probably selling it or making another little profit. Right. They're like a grain elevator. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Gas is a commodity. We're doing all we can with future projects to convert carbon, which will save us energy for treatment, and put it into these reactors to make more gas. This is what we've been waiting for. That. This is what we've been waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, Tom. Gordon Drive Highway 75 interchange deferred from January 3rd. We have to vote on this, Mayor. We vote. Oh, we got to vote on that. Yeah. We can engineers. I can't believe you made it Thank back, you. man. I, I wasn't expecting I, you to do exactly. That. I, was, <laughs> I said I bet you. he's got the day off. Oh my God! I watched every minute of that game. <laughs> What's that? Uh, thank you. Five zero on the last vote. All down to a Five coin zero. flip. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Five zero. All down to a coin. <laughs> All down to the coin coin toss. You have an extra one of these. Uh, one more. You can have mine, Stanley. I was gonna. I'm gonna give one to Mr. Anders, unless he has already copied. Yeah. Let me get you a copy. Well, good afternoon. Dakin. Dakin Schultz, uh, 2800 Gordon Drive, uh, District 3 Transportation Planner, Iowa Department of Transportation. Good afternoon. Hi. We, uh, we were here previously and uh, oh. discussed the uh, US 20 reconstruction project and specifically um, some comments and questions came up regarding uh, the interchange. And so if you remember the last time we came, it was during the public comment period. And so that has been complete and I kind of wanted to walk through um, what, what we heard um, trying to address some of the comments of the public as well as uh, <coughs> comments we received from the mayor as well as other city staff. So anyway, uh, on the screen there is uh, what we had proposed, at least that's what went to the public during the public discussion or the public comment period. And uh, some of the things you'll notice um, the two loops to the north of the project were being, uh, were proposed to be removed. We were removing the northbound to eastbound high speed ramp. We were proposing a turn lane from north, uh, from westbound to northbound, and we did uh, marry up the, the ramps on the east side of the interchange. So that northbound, instead of doing the high speed, I mentioned the removal, it was going to go up and we are proposing signals at the ramp terminals. Public comments, um, we received 14 comments. Um, we had uh, property impact questions, but that was essentially the basis of our <coughs> public meeting was trying to get that because we are, if you remember, this is a project that is two miles um, but after our um, visit with city council, we certainly got some additional comments. Um, we got some that uh, asked why we weren't showing the signals on that public display. Um, had some that said finish the clover leaf, make 26 uh, lanes, uh, complete 20 before you do any other work. And they were referring to Lawton, Mobile, Correctionville, and Holstein. Um, no roundabouts. We did get that one specifically. <laughs> um, we did hear some about the road condition issues out there. And as if you are probably aware, if you drive it at all, we do have some deterioration between the new pavement that was placed a few years ago on the expanded four lane and Sioux City. And then uh, there were supportive comments as well about the project. So. We received the mayor's letter um, and in his letter, he had asked that we leave the current design until development occurs, creating need for change. Um, the roadway grading that we were proposing, if you recall, we were talking about um, taking down the hills, making a more level um, roadway offsetting or uh, 
equalizing the elevations between the lanes, improving sight distance. Those were things that um, seemed to meet approval. And if we were gonna make changes, consider a longer deceleration lane from westbound to northbound, a free movement from westbound to northbound. What does free movement mean again? Can free movement means that you're not coming to a stop. You're essentially entering into gotcha. a designated yeah, lane. So, uh, so northbound to eastbound separate yield control with an acceleration lane and place a be prepared to stop when flashing advance warning for the things that were identified in the letter. So we ended up, I had mentioned in my response back that uh, we would consider the public comments and that we would also um, have a, a review once we received that. We met with a multidisciplinary team within the DOT and discussed not only the comments, but the operation. We had a chance to, um, to go back and evaluate the um, signal warrants. And so some things have been changed or are being proposed to be changed on that design that we had shown at the public. And so we are still proposing to remove the northeast loop. And that's the one that is grayed out there. Um, moving to the east there on that uh, westbound lane. And this is the one that uh, one of the residents had written a letter to you folks about. We are proposing a free right movement to a, to a dedicated acceleration lane. So if you are heading westbound and want to go northbound, it's a separated turn lane. If you move over West uh, on the other side of US 75 in the previous design, we had proposed removing that loop and be, uh, we went back and our um, multidisciplinary team had looked at the traffic and felt we should leave the loop in. So that would be the westbound to southbound loop. We left that in. With that traffic, there was still, um, we still met warrants on the signals and because of the geometry um, of that intersection or, or the uh, lack of storage in the median, it's still being recommended for signals on that westbound intersection as well. We are providing a, um, a ramp across <coughs> from the the uh, southbound or the southbound ramp, and but we are still leaving in place the free movement. So if you were coming from the city from Gordon Drive and heading um, south, that ramp would stay in place. So this ramp would stay in, but we are going to add this connection still proposing the signals because of the lack of uh, median storage. Moving over to the northbound, the east side of the interchange northbound, we are still proposing this ramp to be removed. We bring a, the ramp up to the intersection so those wanting to head westbound will go through the signal, those wanting to head eastbound will have a free movement into an acceleration lane, and that dedicated acceleration lane will carry on for about a thousand feet. Well, I appreciate you revisiting and making some alterations and changes. So that's what we're proposing at this time. Um, I wanted to, you know, after our last meeting, I thought it was important, or we thought it was important that uh, we come back and show you what we've done, what we, you know, that we, just because uh, um, we put something out to the public for public comment doesn't mean that we don't consider everything. So, so. when you're going westbound by your new site, you'll have a turning lane there, looks like a pretty substantial. Right here. Well, no, going into your place. It's all going to be one continuous turning lane, correct? There is a turn lane there, and I don't remember the length of it. Um, 
Is that your trucks point? are going to be able to cross that median there, or are they going to have to go up? Yes, and come there, back? there will be a median crossing here. There will be a left turn there as well for the eastbound. So it'll be a separate lane there. Is so the lane distinction that little thin red line? There's just a little, like going into oh, your driveway. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. There's a little red line there. Is that like the little extra lane? Extra lane that to, for yes. people to turn. So right? you'll notice it shows it's bumping out. It's a minor right turn. Oh, okay. So minor right is what 150, 150 feet. Okay. So to give you an idea, if, if this one's 150 over here, I believe the turn lane. And that would not be a stop condition. Um, I think that one we moved to 480 feet. And, um, and then it'll include the taper as well. But the reality is, and I, and I mean, I know you gotta do what you gotta do, but if you guys weren't building out here, we wouldn't be talking today. This would have been the lowest priority in the state. Well, we've had US-20 on our mind for quite a while, and we wouldn't have to make the modifications, all the modifications, to allow a driveway into our new site. Oh, but you're going to have to put turning lanes in and stuff like that because you're not going to force your trucks to go down to the next intersection and come back, which wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. Right. So a lot of what we're doing here and, and as a result, because of so many complaints you've had over the years about that short turn lane that you have on that northbound lane, which is about a quarter of what it should be at those speeds, that improvement should have been done a long, with or without you building, that should have been done a long time ago. There, there's a lot of reasons why we're doing it. That, that movement I mentioned the last time when I was here, that southbound to eastbound, that's a tough movement. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to fix out here. And what we're proposing is to actually go out and do the work. Well, I was going to say, and whether you were developing or not, I just appreciate that there's the cost sharing structure of this with you building out there. Because if we were just doing it because, gosh, Whispering Creek is all expanding north, there's all this development. And so we need to install some of these mitigation efforts. It would all be on our dime. At least now there are some costs. Yeah, I pressure. mean, this, this is all on us now. I remember when we tried to get a stoplight at Perkins and the Menards exit, and it was an act of Congress, but now all of a sudden... It didn't, yeah, it didn't meet Well, it was. You guys <laughs> fought us. You fought us. You fought us because you didn't want that traffic. You that did. was back. That did not, at the time, it did not meet warrants. You don't know if this and, meets warrants. You're basing it upon a study that says it'll probably... No, we're utilizing the traffic count. It already meets warrants. Yes. Alex made a comment that made me think, how going east, where are our city limits? Right here they, at their site. Are the city limits you annexed out to right about here, and it comes across and takes in our entire site? Front page map here that Buchanan is showing. Where, where's Buchanan? Way down here. Buchanan is further whoop. east. Oh. Ah. To the east. Like that's Buchanan split up. No, that. Yeah, that's Buchanan there. Right there. That's Buchanan right there. Buchanan is over oh. just off the page. So, so Alex said something just triggered in my mind. I mean, wouldn't there be some kind of development that we're going to be going? You're going the other way down Glen Ellen Road. That's that's the big concern for developers is how these guys hook up to Glen Ellen, which is down to, runs down further to, south, runs down to Whispering Creek Golf Course yeah. on the west east side of Whispering Creek. Yeah, right. It doesn't. Yeah, but right. But it, there's a developer looking at yep. stuff to hook it up. Yeah. But you don't think we'd have the same thing, Mayor, going going east for development, especially if we make these improvements or the DOT makes these improvements? A long time ago, not to guess where development's going to occur. Developers make those decisions, yeah. not dumb mayors. No, I think there's a lot of potential. Go ahead. Well, I think there is. Mm -hmm. But you've got a lot of land in between there that's not in the city, too. Go ahead, sir. Um, Jake and I appreciate... Name and address, please, for the clerk. 
Uh, Tom Anderson, uh, resident of Sioux City. Um, I appreciate you say you're leaving in the inside loop in the northwest quadrant. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. The, the inside yeah, loop. Yes. Yes. That's excellent. That helps tremendously. My biggest concern is the huge amount of truck traffic that this interchange is handling now, now that, that Highway 20 is four-laned. Um, so that helps tremendously. It doesn't make those trucks stop, okay? And in the wintertime, fully loaded semis do not stop well, okay? That's the biggest thing we have to be concerned about with the stoplights in there, okay? Um, my question is, why on the northbound to eastbound, why not leave in the present curved exit ramp as it is? That thing helps tremendously, and there's a tremendous amount of storage there um, for truck traffic coming up the hill from 70, going to 75 north to 20 east. Just leave that exit ramp on ramp to 20 east alone. There's no need to tear that out. That would help tremendously. The trucks wouldn't have to hardly slow down, and trucks really burn a lot of fuel when they get down to what you're proposing at maybe 10, 15 miles an hour, but then with the red light there, that traffic's going to be backed up so they won't be able to keep going, you know, on that short ramp that you're proposing. Just leave the it's ramp in the, the south, what is it, the southeast quadrant, northbound to eastbound alone. So on that northbound to eastbound, um, as far as truck storage, that's, that's why we are adding the acceleration lane for that. So there's a designated acceleration lane for those exiting from northbound to eastbound. So but it's about 1,000 feet. And the other thing is it's the ramp um, speed. The design is a 40 mile an hour speed on that so it won't be 10 or 15 miles an hour so the trucks will be able to navigate it. Currently the way the ramp is set up is that the trucks or vehicles coming off are actually able to exit or exiting um, at a higher speed than the operation uh, or the operating speed, uh, the speed limit on US 20 in that area. One of the things that we recognize as we look forward and this goes back now a couple decades, is the desire to make this connection to Glen Ellen Road. Matter of fact, the MPO um, just approved the, uh, uh, the functional classification or reclassification of that roadway to collector. And so it's inevitable that something's gonna happen. We, certainly don't want to put high-speed traffic into a busy intersection. And you know, once, once, that, uh, once that connection is made, the introduction of the additional traffic being introduced into that Glen Ellen, Buchanan, US 20 intersection is going to be significant. So by leaving a, that northbound to eastbound and you're looking at and frankly, you can drive the, that at uh, 65, 70 miles an hour fairly comfortably, throwing you into a 55 mile an hour, and then you've got very little reaction time. Once we go in there, we re, um, regrade this area, that ramp would end up, we'd have to manipulate it anyway. We see this as a safer design. We're looking at the long-term growth. Um, Sioux City, it, it's undeniable that it's going east in this area so and i don't think it's just going to be on the south either i mean we've already had folks have contacted us wanting to know what's happening so you've got water that comes down buchanan already you've got sewer out here it's it's ripe for growth and we're typically the dot is reactionary you know and Frankly, if you look back and the work we did going back to the 2005 study, I would say we're still reactionary, but it just appears that we're, our timing is going to work out pretty good on this. You know, we're still looking at a 2003 um, 
um, construction three and four for this area. So, I'm I'm just saying that you could leave it as it is, and once they exit 75 North onto that on ramp that's there now, you can put a flashing yellow speed sign there, 45 miles an hour, and enforce it. Okay, you can get the traffic slowed down there. All right. That will happen because I'll tell you the truckers do not want to come into a very short shoot where there's going to be traffic backups because of the red light there. And that will take away their ability to keep moving and to go east. Um, truckers are very concerned about having to stop at the red lights. And it's not just a matter of, well, I want to keep trucking at 55. It's a matter of momentum on fully loaded semis. In the winter time, if you have a red light there and if you have a traffic backup and a traffic jam, you're gonna, Sioux City police and fire crews are gonna have rear end accidents there tremendously <coughs> more than there is now. Trucks do not stop well in the winter time on slick icy pavement. And this way, you've got plenty of room for those truckers to move east, put a 45 mile an hour flashing yellow speed limit there, and compared to what you're proposing, they'll love it. They'll obey that, okay? They're already going 65 yeah. and they're exiting, or 70 maybe, as they come around that curve, and then we're expecting them to break down to 45 right away, but Dakin said we're gonna slow them down to 45 already. You've gotta slow them down somewhere, Tom, and what you're saying is you want them to slow down here, and we're saying we're gonna slow them down as they are, they are already taking an action here so we're going to slow them down before they get into this curve. Then they've got the opportunity to accelerate in their own lane as they move forward, I'm as they move east. Go, go ahead and slow them down as soon as they exit 75, maybe <coughs> three, 400 feet after they exit 75, you've got the same effect. Move the 45 mile an hour speed limit sign further south and you can enforce that. But that but they I think what Dakin is saying is that by forcing that action with the new exchange, they will have to slow down. You're just hoping on good faith that a flashing yellow light will slow them down. When I guess I, I'm a very optimistic person, but I think that's even more optimistic than I would be saying, hey, I know you're going 70 and I know you have a high speed ramp that for the last amount of decades, you've been able to go 70. But now we have a sign that says 45 and we mean it, buddy. I mean, you know, I just don't think that's going to happen. You put a policeman or a Woodbury County Sheriff there and you start fining them for doing 55 or 60 there in a 45, they'll learn really quick, okay? But if they have to come to a red light with traffic backed up and they have to stop in the winter time, you're going to have rear end collisions. They will not be able to get going because of the slick icy pavement and you're going to have a massive traffic jam and the police are going to be out there all the time. Okay, that's something that's going to risk police, fire, and ambulance crews, and that's far better than having those truckers occasionally slipping through there at 50, 55 miles an hour on a ramp that works now. Okay, you can always put one in later, okay, if they violate that. You can always put in the shorter exit ramp as he's proposed, but if you take it away, it's gone. But you're proposing that we just take your word for it no, and no, that no, we no, could no, build no, no, that later no. when you it would be all it. on our dime. Because if we built it later, if we trusted you and said, look, we wanted to try your area, we let them build, but now it was wrong. We need the slower ramp. We need to go back to that. And it was all on our dime. No, it wouldn't be necessary. We'll ask for the state to participate. It's still a primary road. It's still, it's correct. It's still their deal. That's not... They still have to go where you just did it today. You got to move. You got to move uh, stuff for street lights on highway on Lewis Boulevard. But it's their dime. They're only moving because we own the street lights. We don't have the main. It's a, It's not at that. It's not at that black and white, Alex. When it okay. comes to state highway primary roads, if there is rear end collisions there with trucks and semis jackknife there because of that red light and traffic jams, it's on your dime. And that's going to happen a lot during the winter.